Ah, thanks. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here. And uh, yeah, I remember very well talking with Sönke maybe three or four years ago. I don't know. Do you remember, Sönke, about how crazy it would be to timestamp uh, scientific publications or something? And, and it's amazing to see how far we have come since then. So it's really amazing. And uh, Sorry, what? I, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. But really great, yeah. And uh, yeah, as you maybe know, I sometimes I prefer uh, to frame it as okay. It's it's uh, it's an endeavor in um, um, moving uh, uh, science and research towards peer to peer. It's not only about blockchain. Blockchain is only one particular means in this space. But okay, let's let's have a closer look. So first, just a very few words about my employer, uh, TIB. So in fact, maybe surprising, uh, I'm a librarian, right? So TIB is uh, the German National Library of Science and Technology, so they say, so they call it. And, and, uh, but at the same time, we are also a University of Hannover's University Library. And uh, being this um, yeah, special library, um, means that we have a huge research and development departments. We have several professorships within our library and so on. You can maybe imagine that. And uh, so, so sorry, I, I have to tell you a little bit about that just to frame a li li little bit more. So for instance, a few years ago, TIB came up with the idea of data site. Who in this room knows about DOIs and data site? Uh, do you know this? So, so okay, not, not everybody. So this was hugely important, this idea of uh, applying a, a, a unique identifier, not only to every publication, but to every data set. So to make raw data, raw research data, citable, referable, uh, to, to, have, to, to have a description um, uh, about every piece of, of research data. And uh, so we kicked off the uh, worldwide network of research data centers uh, before it was cool. Nowadays, everybody is talking about research data and research data management, but back then, 10 years ago, this was new. And, and this spin-off, this TIB spin-off data site, we still host it and uh, we, are proud, we take proud in that. And, and we, we, we continuously do new stuff and try new stuff. For instance, have a look at Generation R. This is a platform that my team just kicked off a few months ago, genr.eu. And that is a platform where we kind of bundle the discourse on open science in Europe, or we try to do that at least. Um, for instance, a few weeks ago, we ran a theme on decentralized web, and uh, we had also contributions from some of the people who are actually sitting here, and, and we, uh, we are leading this discussion on open science, decentralized web, and, and stuff. Or to name another thing, we have the AV portal, which is kind of a YouTube for science. But it does much more than YouTube. It does, for instance, uh, it, it, it supports uh, researchers by having a, um, a in speech uh, recognition of text so that you can search in the actual uh, words that are spoken during a presentation that we have as a video there. And then uh, this uh, speech is uh, tagged, um, matched with um, uh, DBpedia terms and so on. Okay. Just have a look for yourself if you like to. So now a little bit closer um, uh, to where I'm coming from. As I mentioned, I have a little bit of a background in social sciences. I'm an, uh, educated as an academic librarian and worked in this field for several years. And five years ago, I kicked off this team in TIB's research and development department. And yeah, and what are we actually doing there? So what I'm concerned with is on the one hand, just to give you two examples, we um, uh, made this approach of, uh, did 
anybody of you hear about current research information systems like Pure or something? So, yeah, yeah, a few people know this. So this is a huge development in the recent years. So universities now have databases where they try to capture all of the research outcome of their researchers. So you have researcher profiles there. You can look for uh, how expertise, uh, ex expertise developments and and and. Uh, departments com can you can compare by numbers the uh, the outcome and so on and so on and uh, until recently until five years ago or so nobody in Germany knew that there's an open source linked open data approach to this vivo and so we committed to that and by now today we have 15, around 15 research institutions in Germany who use Vivo for uh, like monitoring research output in some way. This is, it, from my perspective, this is huge. And um, so if your research institution is considering to trust Elsevier with their research output and to let them manage this with their offering in this field, like with Skywell or, or Pure or so, think again and consider instead using this approach, Vivo. It's a worldwide alliance taking care of this piece of uh, free and open source software and you can use this instead. And, and to give just another example, so, so research infrastructure, the technical conceptual thing, is only one thing. As you all know, the, 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 the change towards open science is more like a cultural change. It's a change in attitude. It's about knowledge and it's about uh, what, what researchers know about this environment and, and what, what is possible and what are the constraints. And so we take care for this very much. And uh, uh, to give you one example, we had a book sprint in February this year where we invited 15 um, uh, experts from all over Europe, from 10 different countries in fact, and within a week we guided them through the process of writing a book. So we came up with this Foster Open Science Training Handbook, and th that's, this is written by people who actually do workshops, seminars on stuff like open science and data science and, and so on. And um, be because we, yeah, we need to cultivate and grow that knowledge. This is a fast moving target and we, you have to take care for that and we, we actually do that. So have a look at this book if you plan your next uh, open science webinar, uh, workshop or whatever. And uh, yeah, and of course, course it's a CC0 licensed, so it's absolutely open and it's on GitHub and everything, what you can imagine. So, uh, but, uh, okay, let's move closer to the actual topic of today. So, sorry for the bragging, but I need to do that a little bit. So, um, a few months ago, we as TIB acquired, together with, with strong partners from all over Europe, our first uh, Horizon 2020 uh, funding in this particular field. Uh, and this is a project led by the National Technical University of Greece in Athens, which is called QualiChain. And QualiChain is concerned with uh, blockchain-backed educational certificates in higher education. So some of you may know that, that already since two and a half years ago or so, there are actual institutions who are doing this, right? So they, they notarize their uh, like diplomas and so on, uh, all kinds of certificates using uh, blockchains. And what is new about this project, which, which is about to start next year, is that we want to create a, f a fuller, uh, to a fuller extent, a landscape around this. So for instance, we have public employers in mind. It should be easy for them to receive and, and, and uh, check those certificates and uh, make a smarter use of, of them and so on. And uh, please look up, for instance, what the Open University in the UK is doing in this field since more than two years with their open blockchain. It's very well explained on their page. I can really recommend that. And this is always inspiring because higher education is so close to what we do, right, to research, and they are actually maybe one or two steps ahead, so we should learn from them and take, take their building blocks and build upon them. I will go into that a little bit more later. 
And um, okay, what I think and what maybe many of you in this room is, is, is not, not particularly new now, this idea is that this, this, this kind of approach will set new standards in research as well. Uh, at least I hope so. It has this potential. And this means uh, that um, researchers will be allowed to directly own their identity, yes, without detours, without having uh, necessarily to rely on someone's platform, right? And, and this, is, this is at the very core, from my perspective, at what is, po what is possible with blockchain and to have uh, like uh, less delegated trust and more uh, permissionless protocols. Like we have in other spaces already. And you know what kind of innovation the invention of the World Wide Web set off uh, in the beginning of the 1990s. And this was due to the fact that this was permissionless protocols. And now we have permissionless protocols allowing for permissionless innovations and value transfer as well. This is fantastic. And it will uh, shift information markets to say the least. Or at least there's a good hope, a good perspective for that. So yes, but this is not particularly new. So let's uh, have a little bit of a closer look. What, what does it mean to apply a block, this blockchain approach to um, um, educational certificates in higher education? And uh, it, it's ki kind of funny because here in the front row, uh, we have uh, Ursula Georgi, professor from, from University of Pl Applied Science in Cologne, and we just recently had a bachelor student uh, writing his thesis about exactly this and this was really fun interesting experience so this will be a German language but I hope he will publish it so so he compares different approaches uh, for ed digital educational certificates so what what is the inter interesting thing now with uh, with this um, block certs uh, approach. So when MIT Media Lab came up with this in 2016, they coined this open standard, which they call block certs. And the idea is here that you set up uh, your node on a peer-to-peer -peer, um, public blockchain, and then you ask uh, somebody who, um, who gave you the certificate to verify the claim that you got the certificate. And of course, this happens on chain. And so the interesting thing about this is from the moment on, when you receive this verification of your claim, so verifiable claim is also a community draft for a W3C standard by now. I will mention this uh, later again. Um, then um, you are much more independent with this, right? So, if it turns out, let's take for example Malta. Uh, for some reason, I, I never understand this, but for some reason, I mentioned this I, I think yesterday also, uh, the, you have these many language schools in Malta, right? But what happens if one of these schools goes down the drain? Or what have, happens in the case of Hungary? This is not made up, but this happened only a few weeks ago. So the government of Hungary um, decided that there is some particular university of the Open Science Institutes that they don't like, and they forced them out of the country. So what do you do when you are uh, an alum alumni of this institution, and you rely on your future employees that, that they believe you, that you have your diploma from there? But, but it's not, not there anymore, yes? They move to another country, so what do you do? And, um, and here, blockchain delivers really a, a, an elegant, nice solution, yes? So, so, so you have uh, your wallet app, and you own this um, certification and, uh, of your diploma or whatever, and um, you, it's up to you to choose in which way and to who you, pr you, you deliver that proof that you got that certificate. This is what you do, uh, for instance, using, if you want to, um, zero knowledge proofs so that you know that, that only a, one particular aspect or only one diploma of many diplomas you show if you want to to a particular employee. You don't need to show this in public, but you have the proof out there. And uh, it's impossible to, to, to remove it or to strip you off of that, um, 
thing that you achieved. So uh, let's move to a slightly different uh, building block, or what I see as a building block. So some of you may know um, uh, this approach to peer-to-peer to this peer-to-peer -peer approach and science funding. I guess that uh, Ulrich Diernagel in his keynote yesterday mentioned that. Um, so what would you guess how often is Johann Bollen in this paper mentioning crypto economics or blockchain? What, what is your guess? Any number? Zero, right. Okay, you know that. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, zero. That's an interesting thing. So, so this is completely uh, not, not about crypto economics, but about a good idea. And that is to, 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 um, to uh, introduce a new concept in research funding. But actually, with crypto economics, we have the means to uh, realize such an idea, to, 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 ma to make it a reality uh, in a very efficient and lean way, right? So the idea is here to, to, to um, to have a basic funding for every researcher and to force every researcher to um, uh, redistribute a tiny slice of their own funding to other researchers. Yes, and, and with crypto economics, we can actually do that. And uh, I, I point you to this because I think we don't have to constantly reinvent the wheel, but instead we should uh, try to connect the dots, the building blocks that are already out there. This is a great idea. And actually, Johann Bollen uh, ran a simulation on that, yes? And, and uh, he kind of showed already that this has uh, ad certain advantages over the traditional way of research funding. So, and um, then we already are uh, in this um, uh, phase that we do not only have nice ideas and some implementation of ideas, but also more generalized concepts uh, that we have as standards. For instance, we have concepts like self-sovereign identity. If you are not familiar with the term yet, but it was mentioned already yesterday, look it up. Uh, Christopher Allen wrote a fantastic blog posting on this, kicked off this development, but also Shermin Foschengier. Then now you have this um, uh, W3C uh, community draft on that. And uh, the basic idea, again, but more generalized, is what I already told you from the uh, edu educational certificates example. So a verifiable claim is when you set up your node on a blockchain, and then you can ask virtually anybody to, to verify virtually anything about you. And you can uh, think about lots of the transactions that happen in research, like peer review, for instance, just or any kind of assessment as such a transaction, right? But in this case, in this scenario, it would be owned by those who own their node on a blockchain. And um, so the idea here is that we have this already in place. We have uh, um, standards that make sure that this is not just out there as some implementation on one particular blockchain, but it's like um, you, you, you have the, the language uh, that tells you what, what happens there, independent of um, the programming language or the framework or the blockchain uh, where you implement this actually. And you have uh, working examples for that in the wild. So this is uh, virtually everything we need. Yes, and I think, uh, again, we need to connect the dots. For instance, we have already great standards describing uh, how we can attribute, um, how somebody contributed to some piece of research. We have uh, uh, a vocabulary in place to describe things like uh, peer review or other forms of research assessment. So if we wonder how to um, have a machine-readable, executable plan for blockchain-based research funding, um, 
we already have all the buildings black, uh, building blocks for that there, right? So what we need to do next, from my perspective, is to integrate this and connect these dots. So for instance, we, we would need to have a, a, a certain way to speak about how a certain type of uh, research funder um, makes use of a certain attribution to execute their funding on this, right? So that they can just uh, press a button, hit the button, and, and decide, okay, uh, here, here we go, we, we, we take care that uh, somebody uh, who, who um, um, yeah, let's take for instance, um, you, you, you um, are a software developer, and you developed, uh, you developed a certain um, software library that is again and again used in uh, certain pieces of software. You could use this transitive credit approach from Daniel Katz. Have a look at this, it's very interesting. And um, based on this, uh, you could make sure that, that a research funder could indirectly um, um, fund this kind of software development, right? So uh, you would have a machine executable a research funding plan for this kind of software development. And we have, uh, we have all of the building blocks there and we should take care that we target this uh, waste of the hourglass, right? So um, it should be, we, 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 we should formulate this idea uh, independent from the blockchain wh where this is implemented in or, or some certain uh, programming language and it should also be independent from what research fun funders then would actually make of it. You get my point, right? So this is a waste of the hourglass. We should make um, re highly reusable standards and vocabularies to make sure that we are on the same page here and we have reusable concepts for things like this. So, um, Towards the end, uh, I, I thought I, I come up with a wish list for the blockchain for open science community and let's discuss this a little bit maybe if we have time for that. So one thing is, um, okay, we have, we have competition in this room. And this is not, 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 not bad, right? And we, we will have certainly some duplication of efforts due to this as well. So there are uh, similar projects here in this room and you will, um, this is, this, you, you, we will hardly avoid this, right? Y we will sometimes reinvent the wheel. Yeah. But uh, in order to succeed, to make this whole field succeed together, I guess it's super important to agree on some standards, and this takes time and work. We need some at least loose consensus on vocabularies and patterns. Again, that's a waste of the hourglass. We, we, we need to make sure that we can talk about ways of research funding in consistent ways, and to connect it to uh, ways of assessing uh, research where we already have this vocabulary in place. And, and this, this takes time to develop standards like W3C standards or with other organizations, but uh, you should, uh, even as a startup, even as an ICO, you should set aside some time and uh, some, yeah, something of your energy to, to uh, take uh, part in, in those activities. Yes, we, 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 I guess we need this really. And uh, then the other thing, this might sound like, um, okay, not, not so surprising, but again, we should apply open science standards to what we develop here. And by that I mean we should develop open source software. We should, okay, sometimes white papers are interesting. They can be the starter of a certain discussion. They can be inspiring and so on. But uh, more important is to build things in the open, be open for contributions, and yeah, try things in public. Yeah. And I guess this is tried and tested. This works in open source, this works in open science. Let's, let's apply this as, as a best practice here in our field as well, as often as possible. 
And then last point, and I'm not sure about this. This is just a suggestion or thinking out loud. I wonder if there are some things, I mean, if we have this common goal to make um, uh, blockchains a mean for the advancement of open science and, and more agency for researchers and so on, maybe um, we should even have some organization around this yes, to make sure that we take care for our advancements and that we uh, uh, talk with one voice to the public about this, maybe, because we have good examples how this works out there from both fields, from the open science world and from the blockchain world, thinking about Spark and its role in advancing open access in the early days and still, or also thinking about the Ethereum Foundation's role. Now think about what we heard from DEF CON 4 uh, just a few days ago. So uh, the Ethereum Foundation turns out to be really helpful um, for this whole community, which with their diverse projects in helping them to, to uh, develop new standards and, and set, set, setting the uh, agenda for advancing Ethereum. And uh, maybe, I, I, I don't know, maybe we, we, we need something like this for blockchain for open science as well. And uh, thanks to Zönke, we already have a, an organisa organization around this. Maybe this could be a starting point for that. I don't know. Let's discuss this. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you so much, Lambert. This was really great, and especially the last thoughts I can just underline. We need to do this in the open. We have to do this together, and uh, we have to unite to bring this further. Other questions? Then um, maybe maybe I would like to ask one. Um, uh, the, um, the quality chain that you mentioned before, what is the, the timeline there? And um, is it around so far? Is it, is it widely used? And um, what are your wishes maybe in that direction? Um, yeah, very good question. So um, the Open University in UK that I mentioned um, are uh, one of the partners of this project. So I guess this is one, one of our most important building blocks that we already have. And what we are missing yet is uh, like um, an instrumentation for people who sh then should make use of, of these certificates, like, like for instance, public employers. Mm. Yes, We focus on them in particular in this project and in different countries with different roles and so on. And we also make sure that, okay, so far, this is established somewhat to some extent in higher education, but what about professional qualifications that you earn while working mm -hmm. in some company? We don't have proper tools for this yet. So this is the kind of uh, things that we look at, and we will certainly have to make sure that we come up with good standards and vocabularies there as well, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, jo join us if, if you like to. No. Over there is one question. Uh, no. Wait a second until you have the mic, please. I do have. Oh, you have already. <laughs> great, thanks. Thank you very much. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this uh, scientific agency that would be funding uh, research. Has anybody tried to put that in practice? What would be your point of view? How far away are we from making it a reality? Do we have the right resources? Uh, you, you are talking about uh, like uh, okay. more agency for researchers or for no? funding, F so ah, fu okay, funding okay. research outputs. Ah, yes. so, so yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so, so yeah, this is something that concerns me very much in the, in the last few weeks and months. And I guess we we need to uh, have this conversation with funding agencies. So far, I don't know much about this in this area. Whenever I have the opportunity to speak with people from uh, progressive funding agencies like Welcome Trust or Stifterverband in Germany, they always tell me, yes, we are absolutely interested, but we need to further this conversation and make sure that we agree on certain standards and so on. But this is still to be done, absolutely. Important question, yeah. Okay, we're running a little bit out of time, but maybe we have one final question, otherwise we... And of course, next to research funding yeah. agencies, there might be other, s s since it's now much easier thanks to blockchain to have microfunding mm -hmm. things like science what science data is doing now without blockchain and so on um, we will have to look out for other types of funders and funding as well this is exciting yeah. okay thank you so much